Welcome. Welcome everyone to Balticon 55 and this panel of the disastrous reign of Pengla of Dansung. My name is Chidmebi Njaku Brown and I will be the speaker for this panel. If you have any questions about this topic, please put them in the Q&A and I will answer them at the end of the presentation. Looking forward to hearing all your questions, but let's get started and on why this is such a very disastrous reign. Once again, let's begin with the disastrous reign of Pengla of Dansomi. By the way, that's how it's spelled for Pengla and that's how it's spelled for Dansomi, better known as Dahomi. Now, this begs one interesting question. What qualifies me to talk about this? Well, I've been an independent researcher of African history for five years running. I have a degree in history and political science. I've published many podcasts on African history and mythology, and I've taught West African history for over a year. But what was the Dan Somme or Dahomey Kingdom? Well, it was a West African kingdom in pre-colonial Benin, which first started in the year 1600 and ended in 1904 when the French empire took over it. It was ruled by an ethnic group known as the Fon, which was the eternal enemy of the Oyo empire of Southeast Nigeria. They were more well-known and famous for the Mino or Amazon regiments of women warriors. But who was Pengla? Well, Pengla, born in 1735, was the son of Tegbasau, Tegbasau, the diplomat king of the Dahomey Empire. And like many rulers of his day, he would already have children before it was his time to rule. Now, he learned a lot of administrative duties from his father, because his father was a great diplomat and administrator. Today, we would announce Teg Basau as a great king, but in his day, Teg Basau was rather vilified for not being a strong warrior like his great father, Agaja. But Teg Basau did not listen to that. He taught his son economics, warfare, and diplomacy. And over time, he made sure to shift some of the administrative duties over to his son, Pengla, so that Pengla would already have a feel for ruling by the time it would be his turn. Now, he, one thing he was warned to never do, never try and monopolize the slave trade because his grandfather had done it and it had not turned out well for the Dahomey empire. Now, this brings us to our next topic. His father, Tegbasau, known as Tegbasau the diplomat because he had to live in his father's shadow. His father had saved the kingdom from an economic crisis and had defeated many powerful enemies, not through force of arms, though he did fight in the occasional war against powerful empires like the Ashanti, but through his mind and cunning. That's how he was able to beat his powerful enemies with empires far greater than his. Tegbasau stopped them in their tracks. His father also fixed the economic problems by making strong alliances with various merchant classes and merchant princes. And through this, his father was able to create many decades of peace, which was unusual for an empire that was more well known for slave raiding. So very unusual, but thumbs up to Tegbasau. Now, when we move past his father's shadow and look at Pengla himself, Pengla would have a lot of problems to deal with especially after his father would die in 1774. Whenever a king dies, there's usually a succession crisis sometimes. Despite the efforts made by Tegbasau to make sure that Pengla would be seen as the next person in line, there were many in the royal court who believed that Pengla was rather unfit to rule. So this begat the first civil war that Pengla and his own lineage would have to deal with, but not the first civil war that the Dahomey would ever have to deal with. Pengla was able to put down several of his enemies, though, through his own intelligence that he gained from his father, but he failed to get the respect of the people. 
which is not a good thing when you're trying to be emperor. Another problem were the neighbors, the Oyo, the Ketu, the Ijebu, the Benin, and the Bogu were all massive, powerful empires that greatly dwarfed the Dahomey, especially the Oyo being a Yoruba held kingdom in Southeast Nigeria that had many times forced the Dahomey to become a puppet kingdom or vassal state. Penga's grandfather, Agacha, had made attempts to break away from Oyo control, but had mostly ended in failure. But Penga had a crisis. The civil war had been costly. He had lost men and he had lost a lot of his fighting force. So he needed money to bolster that fighting force. So he tried to increase his efforts in the slave trade, get more funds, increase his army size. However, the Oyo Empire, which was the main exporter of slaves in the region, was not going to have any of that. The Oyo sent a terse but polite threat to Pengler, which ended up with Pengler having to spend more money and give even more tribute than usual to the Oyo Empire. They had been given a fixed amount every year to the Oyo to prevent the Oyo from destroying them, but now for this transgression against the Oyo's esteemed dominance, as the Oyo put it, he now had to pay more money, which would further harm the Dahomey Empire. Now, things get even more tricky with the Oyo because during a diplomatic visit, the prime minister of Dahomey died while visiting the capital of the Oyo Empire in 1781. So the Alfin of Oyo, that being the king of the Oyo Empire or emperor for those who prefer, kidnapped and, well, kept all of the prime minister's wives. Not being satisfied, the Alafin demanded Pengla that Oyo should have more Dahomey women. The Alafin wanted 100 more Dahomeyan women. Pengla initially refused this, but the Alafin said, well, if you refuse me, I will conquer your empire. So Pengla was forced to hand over 100 women from his empire in order not to be conquered as well as giving the Oyo some money, which made Pengler even less liked in the empire. Now, the Alafin still wanted more and more, so now he demanded more women. But Pengler decided to use a loophole because this time the Alafin of Oyo hadn't asked for the Homian women specifically, he had just asked for more women. So, Pengler, decided that his best course of action would be to do some good old fashioned raiding on a nearby kingdom, that being the kingdom of Aguna to get the women from somewhere else. Now, you would think that the best force to send would be the famous Dahomey Amazons, these powerful, incredibly strong women that were very good at fighting, could take a lot of hits, and even for fun, apparently, like to fight elephants. But no, that's not the force he uses. Because he listened to his generals who thought that the male force was superior. So when they sent the male force to the kingdom of Aguna, he would end up losing about 90% of his entire male force at the Battle of Aguna. So he had to turn tail and beg the Amazons to help him. So the Amazons got him his victory in 1781 with them capturing over 1,800 women to give to the Oyo, which was, I think, way more than enough payments. So that little crisis solved, Pengler actually focused more on building public works. He is more well known for revitalizing new construction programs and redeveloping many cities in the Dahomey Empire, turning them from tiny villages to members of the big towns and cities that they are today. He would expand the size of the palace and thanks to trade with the Europeans, especially the British and the Dutch, with some little help from the Spanish and Portuguese and occasionally the French, he would build several factories so that he would be independent in steel production instead of having to import iron all the way from the Oyo and be further 
indebted to them. And he improved the overall general welfare of his citizens. Not any of the people he conquered. Remember, this is an empire. His hands are always going to be bloody somewhere. <laughs> now, he would fail his father's warning. And he would anger the Oyo Empire even more by attempting to put tariffs on the Oyo Empire in order to get back some of that money he needed to you know, keep his economy functioning. So the Oyo were not exactly happy with being subjected to tariffs by the Nahomi. So they showed up with a massive fleet outside a lot of the Dahomey Empire's key ports and just put a blockade on the fleets, preventing goods from leaving and further stagnating the Dahomey economy. Feeling satisfied, the oil would leave after the Dahomey Empire went into a deep recession. I've heard of gunboat diplomacy by the British, but in this case, the oil empire used sailboat diplomacy. Warning Pengler that, you know, we have a massive fleet that can destroy you at any moment. Don't try with us again. So Pengler's age was starting to show and whether this was due to all his constant misfortunes or his actual age as we're starting to get to the 1780s, who knows? But now his cousin Fraku is now eyeing the throne. Fraku was also a grandchild of Agaja. And he thought that he could do a better job, that he could return the Dahomey to the glory days when they were a powerful, feared, and respected empire. But Pengler also had a son. Well, he had many. But his eldest, Agonglo, realized that he would likely be in the same boat as his father was and in a civil war. It was inevitable at this point. So he tried to start making backroom deals to secure the throne. Agonglu did manage to secure the support of the ministers. However, he failed to secure the support of the Dahomey Amazons, which is kind of an important thing you need if you want to establish control over an empire. Similarly, Pengla would then die in 1789, but Agonglu, thankfully, due to his backroom dealing, got the ministers to make him king. This caused an outcry from Fraku and many of the other factions that also wanted the throne for themselves. The Amazons, as stated earlier, wanted nothing to do with the civil war, so they wouldn't help Agonglu at all. So Agonglu now had to face three factions vying against him now for power. So Agonglu realized that if he couldn't get the support of the Amazons, he would try and get the support of the local people because the Opposing three factions were making it very difficult for him to enact any new laws or any new policies. So the Dahomey Empire was put in a political quagmire for one entire year. Thanks to the help of the people, he was finally able to defeat his enemies and get acknowledged by the Amazon. So, however, in order to get the love of the people, he had to drastically reduce the taxes. And while the people may love suddenly having lower taxes, in the long run, that's a bad situation for the health of any state. In order to get some of that money back, Agonglo had to allow more slave traders a lot more free reign in order to fill the kingdom's treasury. He also had to allow the European empires a lot more free reign in his lands. And for those of you that know a bit of African history, anything involving the Europeans getting more land in West Africa tends to be a bit of an uh-oh moment. So as for some of his enemies that he couldn't outright kill, he actually placed them as high-ranking members in his royal court, just to keep his enemies close and make them feel important. Now, for the ones that still hated him, that would still try to do their utmost to kill him or depose him, he had them conscripted to the army but as frontline soldiers, that way they would get the ultimate glory and die in battle. That way, people wouldn't be mad. He get, they all had a glorious death. They brought glory for the glory of the Dahomey Empire. And Agonglu threw the massive funeral parties, making it very hard to speak out against Agonglu and making it very hard to 
say that Agongo hated those people because after all, he was throwing them a lot of large funerals. Unfortunately, after all this victory, the Dahomey Empire would suddenly get hit by a smallpox epidemic in 1790, in which 70% of the male population of the Dahomey were wiped out. The only silver lining for Agongo is that the pandemic would spread to their enemies, causing the Oyo royal family to get decimated this time. So now the Oyo were having a succession crisis and their own civil war. So Agongo decided to try and take advantage of this power vacuum. He wanted to use the Oyo civil war as an opportunity to break away from being a vassal state of the Oyo empire. However, all his advisors had to basically browbeat him against doing that because his great grandfather Agaja tried that and that didn't work out at all. It has breaking away from the Oyo empire at this point in time has never worked well for the Dahomey. So, okay, he can't take advantage of this. Then what about expanding the size of his fleet to continue raiding and expand the empire? So he was able to expand the size of the army and they were able to make many successes against low, nearby kingdoms like Mahi. However, when the fleet went to Porto Novo, the, the Gunbaya fleet, and Penga lost 100% of his ships to the Porto Novan coastline guard and the Porto Novan navy. So all that money in, invested into a massive, powerful fleet with ships designed to be similar to European ships, all gone, and so many men lost. Even worse for Agonglo, the British Empire is no longer feeling like trading with him. The British Empire is starting to focus more on the territory of what will become Nigeria, and they're losing a lot of focus in the waters held by the Dahomey because it's all about the new shiny bite of Benin and this new city that they have called Lagos. They are also going to lose trade with the French because at this point in time, France is currently having a revolution. And trade is not going to happen because France's revolution is currently in its whole reign of terror phase led by Robespierre. He's losing trade with the Dutch Empire because the Dutch are more focused on the West Indies. So he can't even get anything done. So another recession affects the Dahomey Empire. This even gets worse when he loses the Portuguese trade because Portuguese ships cannot dock because the current new French Republic, before Napoleon would eventually make it another French empire, kept attacking the Portuguese ships because France at this time had a huge anti-slavery policy. So they kept attacking the Dahomey and the Portuguese, forcing Agonglo to lose any potential revenue from the Portuguese. So Agonglo was desperate. So he sent a missive to Empress Maria I of Portugal, asking for her aid in helping him resume the slave trade. Maria agreed on one condition, that they abandon the established religion, specifically the religion of Vodun, which is the ancestor of a religion many of you may have heard of, Voodoo. Maria wanted the Dahomey Empire to become Roman Catholic. That was the only way the trade would resume. So Agonglo, having no choice, actually agrees to try and get rid of the established Vodun religion. However, this being an established religion, it created a huge uproar in the court as many of the people did not want to be Catholic. They loved being Vodun. So this put Agonglo in a sticky situation. He could either save the kingdom by abandoning the old religion, accepting the new faith and saving the economy, or he could save the religious freedom of his people but have further recessions with the empire eventually breaking apart. He is not in a very good position there. But it gets worse. His, se his second brother, Dogan, hatches a plot to get rid of Agonglo because of how unpopular Agonglo is now, thanks to all this huge religious problems that he has created. 
Now, it is suspected that he had some Amazons to help him because the Amazons were very devout practitioners of Vodou. So the circumstances of Agonglo's death come from two stories. Some people say that Agonglo was shot on his throne or that he was poisoned. Either way, Dogan was responsible for killing Agonglo after they made a final entreaty. Most folktale versions of his death have him been asked by the head of the Amazons to please reconsider the whole Roman Catholicism idea. When Agonglo rejected it, the story goes that the head of the Amazons decapitated him right on his throne. But that's the folklore version. However, it actually happened, Agonglo would die in 1797. Now, in the aftermath of this, Agonglo's second son, Adandozan, would take the throne as a child. So we now have an eight-year-old as emperor. And several members of the court would try to be administrators to guide Adandozan to be the kind of king they wanted. But just because he was eight years old doesn't mean that Adandozan was pliable. Adandozan was filled with rage at the loss of his father. And this child emperor would enact mass executions and sell several of his citizens into slavery. And it all goes downhill from there because it seems that whatever Gongla was trying to do to fix his nation, the advisors that were meant to help his son didn't exactly do the best job of, of advising him not to be a problematic emperor because Agonglo's son would anger the British by trying to kidnap and steal British women as his own wives, purposefully angering the Oyo Empire by attacking towns owned by the Oyo Empire, trying to steal several European factories and claim that they should belong to him because he owned the land and they should now rent out the land for him and pay him a lot more money, angering almost every major European power in the region to the point that he would e eventually be forcibly de deposed. This would continue a downward spiral for the Dahomey Empire that would continue and lead to the Dahomey Empire being put in such a bad situation that they would eventually be overcome by the French, Amazons or no. Because of this legacy, Pengla and Agonglo are seen as the, because some of these were, well, their own fault, but they were dealt a bad hand. But their public work still stands today. Pengla, however, is remembered more fondly than Agonglo is, because Pengla at least tried to copy a bit of what Tegbasau, the diplomat, did. However, Agonglo's loss of the fleet and his military disasters and even further problems made him a bit more reviled and he is seen as being directly responsible for Adandazan, who in Dahomey folklore and culture is reviled as an evil emperor or an evil king, or as, to put a point on it, the Cal Caligula of the Dahomey Empire. And sadly, Adandozan did deserve the Caligula title. So a lot of Agongo's policies would also negatively affect them because the whole reduced taxes, which kept further spiraling the recession, making the Dahomey so broke that they would have to sell a lot of their own citizens multiple times just to recoup the losses. And the kingdom's treasury, even the king's own treasury, would never be as high as it was under Pengla's reign. Now, for those who want the sources for this, since this class is recorded, I have a list of various sources for all this information here for you. Now, for those who want more history from me, I do run a podcast on YouTube under the handle Afrostorian where I talk about this at length, and I actually have a three hour long podcast on the Dahomey Empire and way more emperors and more actually heroic tales and battles regarding the Dahomey. But that's all I have regarding Pengla and Agonglo. The reigns may have been short, but they are quite memorable. Now, I believe some of you may have some questions for me, and I'd be willing to field your questions and answer them as well as I can.
So does anyone have any questions? I'm not seeing any questions. I do see that someone has raised their hand. Uh, Miss Ada Injaku. Uh, well, let me answer the first question before I answer her. I was able to do the research in this area because I was able to access a lot of the material from the Library of Congress and the African History and Art Museum at the Smithsonian. That's how I was able to get the information regarding this. Now, to answer and to answer Kylie Selkirk, what happened to Dogon after he killed Agongro? Well, he was killed by Adandozan. Adandozan would have him arrested and then publicly executed. He was part of that mass execution that ended up with over 2,000 people dead. As for the name of my, my podcast, Krista, it is again Afrostorium. On YouTube. That's how I'm there. As for how he did as an 80 year old king, well, not too well. Again, Adandozan was a brutal emperor, very vociferous in his tastes and very vicious of mind, to the point that there's even he was even mythologized as being an angry giant bull. In some folklore of the Dahomey, Adandozan is re represented by a giant evil demonic bull who would later get defeated by the rightful true king of the Dahomey empire, Lion King style. Now, if you want to learn more about the regions of this empire, I would suggest starting with Stanley B. Alpern's Amazons of Black Sparta. And for those who do not have access to the Smithsonian, you are able to request a lot of these books from interlibrary loan for your own personal research purpose. And why with Amazons was there no female political power? The Amazons did have a, a lot of political power. They were traders, they owned a lot of shops, they owned land, they had their own servants and slaves, but they were meant to be separate from the rest of the political world. You don't want your most powerful military get into involved in the political process or deciding who gets to be king as the later emperors of Rome would find out with the Praetorian Guard. So it's best to keep them out of the political sphere and make, and make sure that they wouldn't become a danger to the king or the, or the empire itself. So that's... So that's the answer to that one. Now, I believe, Miss Adan Jaku, would you mind typing out your question? Because I believe you had raised your hand in the chat. Yes. Would you mind? And, if, and while, while you're typing out your question, I'll answer everyone else's. Miss Richards Taylor, has that question been to your satisfaction? Has that answer been to your satisfaction, rather? <laughs> so now, As for why the Amazon take over, because they were raised from birth to believe that they should serve the empire. They were indoctrinated from as ages as young as six that they must always serve in a military capacity and never truly seek power, that they must do what they believe is best for the Dahomey, but never try to rule it. With enough indoctrination, you can believe anything. As for why I currently teach classes, I teach classes on a platform known as OutSchool, which is an online virtual platform where I teach many history and mythology classes as well as paleontology. That's the platform I mainly use. Yes, Carol, they were brainwashed essentially into being the ultimate warriors and servants of the Dahomey Emperor. But as seen with a gonglo, when you push them too far, when you make them believe that you are not acting in the best interests of the Dahomey Empire, 
you get killed, as was seen. So, oh, you're going to ask about the 80-year-old emperor. Oh, no problem, Mr. Joppy. Now, Clint Ryan, you have a question for me? You can either type it in the chat or type it in the question and answer section. Yeah. Well, to Miss Richards Taylor, it was more cultural and spiritual conditioning on the Amazons. Women didn't have as much independence in the Dahomey Empire as you might expect, considering even when you think about the Amazons, only the Amazons had a lot more independence. And the only way for a woman to get a leg up in life was to become an Amazon. So through the religious doctrine and cultural doctrine, most women thought that the only way that they could rise up was if they put themselves in a position to directly serve the empire and the emperor. So they did not have equal rights in this, with men in the Dahomey Empire. And the Amazons were a specific sort because they were above everyone in the empire except the emperor. There. Yes, in, in a way, sort of, Miss Carol. In a way. They were treated as, some, as a commodity. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's what they did. The women were treated as a commodity. They had no value unless they could be warriors. Now, the slaves they were selling, Mr. Monk, the slaves were people from all around the area, usually their neighbors or small kingdoms that were too weak to stand up against the Dahomey because the Dahomey empire's form of expansion was to do acts of slave raiding on the nearby territories. And once they sold the main citizenry off into slavery, they would then claim the now empty lots of territory for themselves and then let their people move in so that they could demographically own that area as well. So the slaves could range from being Igbos, uh, some small Gedevi ethnic groups, just anyone in the area. And while they were the main slave raiders, they were not the main exporters. That would go to the Oyo who had more of the grand monopoly in the area. The warriors never really learned to be students, but they were taught pottery and, and art, and they were taught about economic management because a lot of these Amazons will end up owning land and territory. Mm -hmm. Students were mostly only boys and men. So, Mr. Monk, is that, has your question been answered satisfactorily? So I, will, I am willing to field more questions uh, until the time ends, but feel free to ask anything that's on your mind. Does anyone have any more specific questions about Algonglu and Pengla themselves, or are people more interested in how the, the kingdom and empire worked? Because that's what I seem to be getting, which I don't mind. <laughs> so let's see. By the way, for those of you that enjoy Balticon, they do have a GoFundMe. So that if you can, please go to their GoFundMe page where they do sell items that can be used to support them and continue hosting cons because I would love to continue doing this for many years down the line. And it would be a bit problematic if there was no way for me to provide all this information in the future. So it's not something I demand, it's just something I request, if you can. So. Actually, Miss, uh, actually, yes. They, the Dahomey Empire did start having, using a lot of European styles because it was the only way to economically advance. Because if you wanted to trade more with the Europeans, you had to be more like the Europeans. You had to look more, as the Europeans would put it, civilized in order to get the good stuff, so to speak. If you wanted the best guns, if you wanted the best 
ships, if you want the best knowledge of weapons, if you want the best, most well-run factories, you had to change your attire to be slightly even more European. Even later emperors of the Dahomey, even though they would still have the fires, would still use dyes and cloths and colors that were mostly coming from Europe especially dyes that were not normally found or produced in the Dahomey Empire. So yes, they started using some European styles, but you wouldn't see them going Victorian in their attire, even by the 1800s. They would still have their own unique identity because later they would shift back to the old Dahomey styles of fashion because they, want, they saw where the winds of change, chains were blowing after the scramble for Africa had been announced by the various European empires. Mm -hmm. So, does anyone else have, have other questions on their mind? They, well, Ms. Morgan, the Europe, Europe did have a meeting in the late 1800s on the Africa scramble. They did agree among themselves at the time where on the continent of Africa, they would partition among themselves. So it was a bit of a political one upsmanship, but they did agree beforehand where they would, what kind of territory they would take on the African continent. Now, as for the smallpox epidemic, and yes, thank you, the Berlin Conference, the smallpox epidemic seems to have been brought in by European traders accidentally. It wasn't a let's give them smallpox blanket situation like had been done to the Native Americans. Instead, in this specific case, some sailors seem to have brought it with them and the Dahomey people having no natural immunity to smallpox soon caught it and it actually spread throughout a lot of West Africa, not just the Dahomey. The smallpox epidemic ravaged a lot of West Africa, going as far as Cameroon and even upper parts of Chad and almost reaching Ghana. It will get to the point that about, for the, for the oil empire, they would lose 50% of their population. And while the Dahomey would lose 70% of their male population, they actually will continue to lose more men down the line to the point that the Dahomey Empire's demographics will be skewed in favor of women. In later years, the population of the Dahomey at one point would be 80% women. That's how bad the smallpox epidemic will get. As for the Vodun religion, it is the ancestor of the more well-known Caribbean variant, Voodoo. It's Vodun takes a little bit from many religions around it, but it's specifically a more animist religion, worshiping the environment around them where everything in nature has a spirit or sometimes known as a loa. They did have gods of their own, yes, some of which were borrowed from the Yoruba's own gods and gods from their neighbors, similar to how the Romans borrowed from the Greeks, but it was more of a spiritual connection with the land type of religion, that you should more connect with the local spirits and the local land, and those are what you should venerate, as opposed to the more Maria's idea of Roman Catholicism, in which they all had to answer to a higher god or higher power. The Vodun, the Vodun worshippers preferred Vodun because to them, they could actually see their gods because their gods were all around them. The gods were in the trees, the gods were in the rocks, the gods were in the land. That was also why they resisted it because to them, the idea of the Christian God was intangible and insubstantial and couldn't exactly be exactly touched. The Vodun religion would eventually make its way to Brazil the Caribbean and parts of America such as Florida and Louisiana through the slave trade. But each, the Brazilian Caribbean and 
American versions all have their own little twists due to the various cultures. Some gods' names will be changed around and they will be featured very differently. Like for those who have seen The Princess and the Frog, it has a lot of influence from Vodun there because a lot of the symbols are actual Vodun symbols. So <clears throat> do, we have, do we have any more questions? All right. Very well. It was my pleasure to give you all this presentation. I hope you all enjoyed this little part of history. And I wonder if we should feel sorry for Pengla and Agongo because some of it was their fault, but they got dealt a bad hand. So for those of you that want their students to learn more African history from me, you can find me on OutSchool. For those of you that are adults and want to listen to some history, you can find me on YouTube. Otherwise, I look forward to you next Balticon and see you then. It was my pleasure to provide this information. No, thank you for coming. See you all and enjoy the rest of Balticon. <laughs> thank you indeed.